Welcome to the second half of Fire Alarm and Detection Systems. In the previous module, we talked about the components of Fire Alarm Systems. And today, we are going to talk about the different types of Fire Alarm and Detection Systems. We're also going to talk about the requirements and the maintenance and um, the interaction with other fire protection systems. So our objectives are we're going to listen, discuss the different fire alarm system classifications. We're going to list and discuss the interface capabilities between a fire alarm system and the other fire protection and life safety, safety systems. We're going to list and discuss the different conditions, situations, and circumstances used to determine whether manual fire alarm and automatic detection systems uh, are required or not. We're going to describe the different uh, acceptance and uh, periodic inspections and tests. So whenever one is put together, we have to do acceptance tests. We, we make them show that everything works. And then we require that there be inspections uh, on periodic time basis. And they have to be maintained and records have to be kept. So the types of fire alarm systems that are installed in a particular building depend on a lot of different factors. And of course, this is determined by what it says in the code. Remember when we studied codes, we said the code tells us what to do. So the code is going to tell us where there has to be fire alarms. Now the systems are classified according to the the way they operate. So and the way they operate when it activates. <clears throat> so what happens? Excuse me. Do you just get an alarm there at the building or does uh does it send a message to some station far away? So uh the party responsible for the activities associated with the alarm is determined by the type of system in, installed. So does an alarm company monitor it or is it monitored there at the site or is there no monitoring other than bells go off and somebody has to hear it and call the fire department. All of these things are determined by what NFPA 72 says. So again, uh, the NFPA and the ICC have model codes. Here in California, you need to know that we use the ICC model code, so the International Fire Code and the International Building Code. Well, even though we don't use the NFPA's fire code, we use their standards. So the code is going to tell us what we have to do, and it's going to be based on use and occupancy. It's going to be based on the number of occupants, it's going to be based on whether there's levels above or below exit discharge. Do they have a basement? How many floors high are they? Uh, what kind of products are they uh, making there? And whether uh, other fire protection systems are required to be installed. Now, one thing um, I'll point out on that is that just because you have a fire alarm system, doesn't require that you have a sprinkler system. But the opposite is true. If you have a sprinkler system, you have to have a fire alarm system. That's just the case. That's the way it works. So there's two basic broad categories of requirements. And that is the manual fire alarm systems and the automatic fire detection systems. Now, a manual fire alarm system requires someone to turn it on. It's the simplest of all systems. Automatic fire detection systems, like your picture on the right there, can involve a big, huge fire alarm control panel, hundreds, even thousands of fire uh, initiation devices, as we called them last week, uh, fire detection devices, and then, or, or smoke or whatever. And then, of course, there's the notification devices. 
So that's complicated and it automatically works. It doesn't require a human being to be involved. Most automatic fire detection systems might have a manual aspect to them, but not all. Sometimes we don't want manual uh, pull alarms, like um, somewhere where we might get a lot of false alarms. So some people believe that every building in the whole United States should have a fire alarm or detection system. And um, th there are reasons why not every building gets them. Just some situations are not suitable. Uh, you're going to get, like I said before, unwanted false alarms. That's sometimes the hazard just doesn't warrant an alarm or detection. If you have a, a strip mall of offices that has a variety of occupancy types, we'll talk about that in a second, you're probably going to be required to have it. But if you've just got a building that's a, a duplex with two uh, office portions, one's an insurance agency, the other one is who knows, some kind of a basic office for a realtor or something. Um, yeah, you know, you might not need an alarm system. Uh, maybe they want a burglar alarm, but they might not have to have a fire alarm. So it depends. Um, the, you know, the installation requirements, sometimes it just doesn't need that protection. So the main uh, reasons that are going to be looked at, and so it's not just simple. You build a building, you have to have a fire alarm. It's going to be based on predominantly occupant type, occupant load, the occupant capability, the ability to ex exit the building, possibly the building height or whether it goes down below a uh, level, and, uh, you know, as I said before, the number of levels above or below. So it, it can be especially important when a building is large or has a large number of occupants. So let's look at those different categories. Um, the number of occupants. Now, that's what we call the occupant load. So before we really talk about that, I want to clarify for you. Some of you have taken... Um, my fire prevention course or another fire prevention course and you understand occupant occupancy type or use group and we're going to talk about that a little bit more but um, you know suffice it to say here that what you're doing in a building whether you're making things or people are watching a movie or whether you're repairing cars or whether you're displaying cars all of these things are different uses and that use those uses have been um, generalized into categories and we call those categories occupancy types so there's a for assembly b for business c for camps e for education f for factory uh, h for high hazard and uh, I for um, institutions like prisons or hospitals. And, and so it goes on and on. There, there's many more, uh, S for storage and M for mercantile. Um, but those different occupancy types, are, it's going to play a factor. The occupancy type also plays a factor in how many people are allowed in there and how many exits are required. So the number of individuals and their location in the structure are factors that are taken into account when they determine whether or not there has to be an alarm system. Of course, some kind of public assembly building is almost always going to require an alarm system. Um, some of them smaller, you might have a small restaurant where sprinklers aren't required, but an alarm is. Um, or maybe if it's small enough, a little coffee shop, maybe you don't have to even have an alarm system. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm, I'm shooting from the hip there. There are differences in that threshold limit between the NFPA model and the ICC, but we use the ICC. So don't even worry about NFPA's fire code. But just know that NFPA's uh, threshold limit of what requires it versus the ICC's are slightly different. 
The occupancy load does not factor into requirements for automatic smoke detection in assembly or business occupancies. If it's required, smoke detection is your most basic system. And so if an alarm system is required above and beyond manual, then they're probably going to have smoke. That's just, we're, we're not going to play games with how many people are there, how high is it. Smoke, you got to have it. The building height. It, you know, as comes into play, if we're, if we've got portions of the building that are in the basement and there's people down there, probably going to have an alarm system. If you go up in multiple stories above ground, you're probably going to have an alarm system. So some occupancy types and occupancy loads that if they were in a single story building might not have to have it. But as soon as they go two story or down into a basement, now they're going to have to have it. So again, smoke detection isn't going to be affected by that. It's just, if you have to have it, you will have smoke detection. Um, the level of the exit discharge. If there are a number of occupants who are below the level of exit discharge, then you're probably going to have to have it. Um, and the same for below. So neither of the model codes requires automatic smoke detection installation purely based on the level of exit discharge. Again, as I said before, smoke detection is usually required. If we have to do anything above manual, then smoke detection is the baseline and how high, how low isn't going to make a difference on whether you have that or not. I'm not going to repeat that anymore. It's said it three times. <laughs> so uh manufacturing and so what you're going to do there what you're going to make so if you're you know bake, making things that have a high uh fire hazard like let's just say it's a um cabinets uh, a kitchen cabinets making uh facility where they're cutting and there's lots of sawdust and there's lots of wood probably going to have not only a alarm system probably going to have a sprinkler system so some places are absolute requirements for automatic detection and manuals not even an option anywhere that has highly toxic gases has organic peroxides has oxidizers that are stored there oxidizers enhance fire so um if if it's above the threshold limit of how many much you can have definitely going to have a fire alarm system so um, as I said before, there are different kinds of uh, special use or occupancy conditions. So in the International Building Code and the Fire Code, a manual fire alarm system is going to be required in anything that's underground. That's deep underground. Um, it's also going to require automatic fire detection in any kind of a building that's classified as high rise, 75 feet or higher. So any office building, hotel, apartment, condominium, probably going to have automatic fire detection. Excuse me, I had to take a drink. Um, hey, I want to go back to that. Sorry about that. So as we talked about use and occupancy conditions, one of the kinds of occupancy types that is going to be required to have a fire alarm system is anything having to do with education or care of children too. So that kind of a use or occupancy condition, absolutely going to have some kind of fire alarm system. We'll talk about that a little bit more. So back to what I was saying, uh, the required installations in some occupancies, automatic sprinkler systems permit the exclusion of manual fire alarm boxes, not the fire alarm. They got to have the fire alarm. But if they have sprinklers, they don't have to have the manual fire alarms. Um, automatic systems uh, installation permit the omission of smoke detectors in a few exceptions. But again, smoke detectors is usually bottom line. But there is the rationale that if you get enough heat to where the sprinkler system goes off, you're going to get a fire alarm, but it's going to be slower than you would have got with smoke detectors. So usually, again, smoke detectors is the baseline. You're going to use almost always, few exceptions, have at least smoke detectors if you are required to have something more than manual. 
So um, <clears throat> with the different kinds of fire alarm systems, NFPA categorizes them based on the operational events. So what's going to happen when there's an alarm? How the signal uh, monitoring happens, how the reporting takes place. Some systems rely on a person to initiate the alarm. That's a manual. Some systems automatically activate and not only activate, but report to some kind of a either a local uh, proprietary uh, station or to a remote station, usually owned by the alarm company under contract with the owner of the building. So these sophisticated systems can automatically activate and report exact information to personnel on site and off site. So when we classify them, this is uh, based out of NFPA 72. Again, it's based on what happens when there's an alarm and how there's an alarm and whether the system serves more than one purpose. So there's two broad system classifications of local and remote. But then there's five subcategories. The five subcategories, um, you know, based on number of detectors, type of system, depend on the size and the layout of the building. So on all those factors we talked about, whether it's required, then also it's going to say what kind of a system. So again, the fire code's going to tell us what to do. You must build a local alarm system according to NFPA 72. You must have an automatic detection system with remote supervising station according to NFPA 72. So that tells them what they have to do and where to find the how-to. So those five uh, systems are single station, household fire alarm systems, protected premises fire alarm systems, multiple station systems, and combo systems. Protected premises are the local fire alarm systems. So on a protected premises system, the alarm is only going to happen there at the property. There will be audible and visual notification within the property. And the most simple of that, like I said, in a daycare. Now, if you have an elementary school, you're usually going to have a much more intricate system with some manual pulls and automatic and there'll be a, 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 a fire alarm control panel in the school office. But let's look at a, a daycare that's in a home with just six children. They're still required to have a fire alarm system, but it is local only. It is very simple. It's a switch or a manual pull and a bell, horn or buzzer and maybe a, a visual device, a light. So it can be as simple as just a single switch and some kind of a, a noti notification device, or it can be as intricate in a protected premises system. Sometimes it notifies occupants or staff. So sometimes we don't want to have an alarm that goes throughout the whole building until it's gone to the security station, like in a prison. We don't want all the prisoners to know that we've got a fire alarm going off until we've checked to what it is. So there'll be a protected premises uh, supervising station on the property. Fire alarm doesn't necessarily go off, or maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, depending on what's required. But there's no automatic communication to the outside. So someone has to call the fire department. Protected, protect, uh, protected premises systems, one of the reasons I don't like them is that sometimes the security people will uh, call one of the other security personnel, say, hey, I've got an alarm over at Building 12, go check it out. And this guy goes over in his little golf cart, and he's going slow, and he finally gets over there, and he opens the door, and there's smoke. 
well, now we've detained the calling of the fire department by five, 10 minutes, whatever, however long it took him to get over there or her to get over there. So, you know, it's, it's allowed under certain conditions, but the one uh, main thing is there has to be 24 hour, 24 seven supervision at the, the um, reporting station. So uh, when we have a simple local alarm, so like if it's just a manual pull fire alarm in a basic daycare, even smaller daycares um, that are like associated with a church or something, if the building doesn't have an alarm system, they're going to be required to have a basic manual pull fire alarm system. It will oftentimes have a sign outside by the bell and by each manual pull device required by NFC, NFPA 72, a, a sign like the one you see there in the picture on the left, local alarm only, in case of fire, call 911. So there'll be one of those by, it, there might be one by the bell that says, if bell is ringing, call 911. Fire department has not been called or something of that nature. Now, household fire alarm systems are uh, similar in that you're going to get an alarm there, but some of them are local only. So you might have a siren or a buzzer that goes off, warns those of you in the house, and hopefully one of your neighbors will call the police department. Unless there are household fire alarm systems where you can contract with the alarm company and they monitor it but not necessarily so, especially in these new ones uh, being put forth by companies like Simply Safe, um, Ring, and other things like that. Uh, you have to activate, activate or call the fire department. Now, uh, there's, with the different kinds of fire alarm systems, there's going to be a supervising station alarm. Uh, now, there's proprietary, like I talked about, there's central station, and there's remote supervising station. Now, these are slightly different, and we'll talk about them in a second. Uh, there's also public emergency alarm reporting systems, which um, might just go off in a building and put off uh, voices, or there's public emergency alarm reporting systems that are like um, if if a, a release at a plant would cause harm to the people in, in that area, there'll be this public alarm that goes off in the community, some big loud siren. So a central station uh, service fire alarm, they, they have to be listed central station or a local service company, and there'll be requirements. If there's going to be a central station that's um, it has to have a digital alarm communicator transmitter and the the central station facility has to have a receiver that um, receives the message. Now, when we have a remote supervising station, that's going to be off-site and usually, well, not usually, always has to have personnel who then, and you can see the in the uh, photograph in the bottom right, the woman who has all of these computer screens in front of her and she sees any alarm but also trouble or supervisory signals and she notifies the property uh, owner if it's a trouble or a supervisory but if it's an alarm she will call the fire department first then she will call the building owner or he whoever so these are off-site property protection companies and usually, uh, not usually, always in these cases, there's some kind of a contract where they're paying them for this service. If they're required to have a remote supervising station, then they've got to do it. Um, you can't, you know, people want to save money and not pay that monthly payment or annual payment. But if they have an automatic system that requires remote supervising, then they've just got to do it. It's required. When they have these remote supervising systems, there's going to be transmission through a phone line usually, 
but sometimes now with all in this digital age there are other versions but it has to go through a dedicated channel to that public safety communication center so now sometimes it actually goes to the fire department um, or the dispatch center for the fire and police usually that's in smaller communities somewhere like ventura county or la county san bernardino they're so big they're going to make people contact um, a super remote supervising station and then the monitoring personnel there contact the fire department so and then like i said signal the owner if the if it's trouble or supervisory now i mentioned this before so in a local system or a protected premises system that doesn't mean there isn't going to be personnel that are reporting because if they are a facility that's large enough to where normally they'd be required to have a, a, a remote station, but for various reasons, they don't want to have an automatic alarm and an automatic calling of the fire department. Like I mentioned before, a prison. Or I had an, um, another facility, a school here in town called California Institute of the Arts, and uh, it's a bunch of hippie artists who go to school there. And uh, I always joke about that because there's some really interesting people there. And I inspected them for four years. Now, um, they had a proprietary supervising fire alarm system. The only reason they were allowed to have it, and look at that fourth bullet point, they had staffing 24-7 at the... Uh, fire alarm control panel and they had a um, communication system and multiple security personnel on the site. As I said before, I don't like that delay. They get the alarm. They send somebody over to look at it. They call back and say, hey, we got smoke. Call the fire department. Uh, set off the fire alarm for the facility. I don't like that delay but under certain conditions the fire code allows for it so it's usually where the owner controls multiple alarm systems in one building the monitoring personnel are always there and they notify the fire department now um, when we have these different kinds of systems especially in a high rise or in um uh like entertainment buildings or amusement buildings we're, we're going to have some kind of a communication system if you have a proprietary system you have to have this a way to communicate with the security personnel with the people in the building so um in some of them it's like at the staple center a mass notification ability in the building either by using the pa system or a computer generated voice response, you know, uh, please calmly make your way towards the exit, yada, 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 gives them directions. Or a wide area mass notification for a community, like I said, it, those are one way emergency communication systems. There are also, especially in high rise buildings, oftentimes two way emergency communication systems where the person in the monitoring station there that you can see in the picture on the right has the ability to talk to people in different rooms or on different floors. And they can, you know, contact him and say, I tried to go outside, I can't get outside, there's smoke outside my door, um, and, you know, I need rescue or whatever. There's an ability to communicate both ways and give instructions and ask for help. These systems are usually in installed in high-rise buildings, as I said, buildings with large occupant loads like the, the Staples Center or some large um, public facility, for, uh, pub uh, public assembly facility. Also special amusement buildings. Have you ever been on a ride in Disneyland and it broke down? You're not allowed to evacuate on your own. <clears throat> they will communicate through this communication system. They will talk to you, tell you to stay in your seat, and then someone will come to you and they will escort you out. In the meantime, you spent $200 to be at Disneyland and you've been on a ride stuck for three hours. 
so they better give you a ticket for another day, right? I don't know if that happens. Um, provide now this provides also first responders with the notification tool to manage evacuation so not only security personnel there but then when the fire department gets there they're going to take over those um, communication systems and talk with people and find out where they're needed and where they're not needed and things like that and they can give broad instructional messages or specific now, one of the cool things about fire alarm systems, and those are our types and the way they happen. So we're going to move on from that. One of the cool things about fire alarm systems is they're so intricate. And remember, I said NFPA 72 is in a notebook that's about two inches thick. That's like a school notebook, big, big 8 by 10 paper, um, two inches thick. It's very detailed. There's a lot of information. But it's because it can do so much and it's very intricate. So a fire alarm system can, you see the picture there, that's a magnetic uh, lock on an exit door that's related to a fire um, rated corridor. So that's a fire rated door that normally would re be required to be closed at all times. But because maybe uh, this is a convalescent home and they want the seniors to be able to come and go. Well, I want to protect my fire rated corridor. So what I do is I require them to put that magnetic door on there. When the alarm goes off, it releases the magnet. The door automatically closes. Now you can push on the panic hardware. You can open the door again, but it'll automatically close behind you. It will keep the door closed in a fire rated corridor. Um, so it can close doors. It can actually unlock doors. And it can uh, always will, if there are elevators, it makes the elevators go to the bottom floor as soon as there's an alarm and it shuts down their capability. You have to have a special key to make it work or the system has to be reset. Uh, it can turn on and off the air conditioning or the air handling equipment. It can turn on the smoke control and evacuate smoke and gases from the building. Close fire dampers. And it can, of course, monitor and activate fire suppression systems throughout the building. It's pretty cool, all the things that um, it can shut down the gas utilities, all sorts of stuff. Many, many things that because it's electronically controlled, a fire alarm system can do. So NFPA 72, as we've said, gives us the standards of how to do it. So the design, the installation, the inspection, the testing, all of that's in NFPA 72. So it's going to talk about what kind of wire, what kind of hardware. Of course, all of the components have to be listed by either UL or Factory Mutual. But uh, what's the power requirements? Does it require battery backup? Which it usually is. When do you have to have a generator instead of batteries to back up? All of these things are going to be in NFPA 72. So the minimum requirements, and these are minimum requirements, not maximum. You can go overkill. You can build a system that has features that aren't necessarily required and overkill. That's up to you. Um, and of course, the NFPA 72 and the code might reference other standards other than NFPA 72, like the electric code and other codes that might be involved, mechanical code or something like that, um, with specific issues. So uh, not only does it tell you how to build it, it tells you how to keep it working and when we allow it to be um, considered complete. So when it's being installed, there's going to be inspections that are um, acceptance tests. And then, and that's initial. So now we might go in and look at the wiring while they're installing it. We might have to go in and look at other components while they're being installed. But then there's the final acceptance test. Now they want the fire marshal or the fire inspector to come out and give that acceptance test. And it's very detailed. You basically have to show me that every single device works. But because larger buildings, that's a very long, detailed process, we might not check every single device 
but they have to prove that they did. So they will be required to fill out Form 72, right? There's an NFPA Form 72 acceptance guarantee. So it's their guarantee that they write down that they're providing this company with a properly built system. If there's problems with the system, it continues to be put on them <coughs> because they guaranteed it. So the inspector will test the system. And uh, here, let's go to this next slide. Um, and they'll do an acceptance test. So they're going to check the uh, that it's designed in a sound manner. Now, that's through thorough plan review before it even gets built. And, and they have to give documentation that all the parts that they're going to use are um, UL listed parts and are parts that work and are, it's, the system's going to be built to, um, according to NFPA 72. So once we sign off on those plans and there are engineers who are going to do detailed inspection of the plans before we say you can build it. Once we say you can build it, now they start working on it and they've got to do a proper installation. So now we're going to come back and uh, give oversight throughout the process, but that final acceptance test. Now, as I said, they really want that test to happen because until the fire inspector, so we see here, uh, this female fire inspector is going through a test on a system and see how she's holding a radio so somebody's turning on and off different parts and they're communicating together as they look through the whole system and and check it they don't get paid until that inspector signs off on the inspection so when they haven't done something right Oh, and this just frustrates the heck out of them. And I've got to say, there's a little diabolical part of me that always loved doing this. If they didn't have, like, according to NFPA 72, they're supposed to provide a set of plans that will be, that will live there by the fire alarm control panel. They're supposed to have a sign on the door that says, this is where the fire alarm control panel is. There's supposed to be a smoke detector above the fire alarm control panel. All of these little kinds of things sometimes the fire alarm company will try and skimp on them and so we go to do the inspection and i see that they don't have a set of plans there and i go oops sorry you failed uh call me when you're ready with a set of plans and oh they get so frustrated no come on mr osborne you're here we're here let's do the test nope nope can't do it uh this is a fail oh hey you don't have a sign on the door you got to put the door on it's a fail and oh, uh, but here's the deal. Okay, it's besides the diabolical side of me that just kind of loves twisting the knife in their back. Um, the reality is, once I sign that paperwork, I don't have the hammer anymore. I have a hammer that they know they aren't getting paid until I sign it. So I make sure that every T is crossed every i is dotted all the ducks are in a row before i sign that final acceptance test okay a few more slides here um so there's also in nfpa 72 uh, guidelines actually requirements as to the routine inspection that they're supposed to do on site their facilities personnel are supposed to check certain things on a regular basis is it is the system got a trouble alarm does it have a supervisory alarm is anything malfunctioning so they're supposed to check that um, but also there are requirements as to um, testing it at certain intervals and servicing it and maintaining it usually maintenance is every five years um, on most systems uh, they also are required to keep records of all of that and if they are getting multiple false alarms because of lack of uh, proper testing or service or maintenance, we oftentimes will start charging them every time we get a false alarm call. And that motivates them to um, get it fixed. U.S. fire departments responded to, yep, almost 2 million false alarms in, back in 1998. This is an old uh, statistic, but 
pretty amazing. 851 of those were due to alarm system malfunctions. So false alarms uh, put the fire department at risk. Um, they remove resources from being able to deal with the heart attack right down the street. And they also change human behavior because like in a college dorm, they get so many false alarms because of people popping popcorn in the microwave. Then they get to the point to where, oh, that's not an alarm. It's not the real thing. And they don't respond. And as I mentioned, I believe in the previous module at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, it cost a couple of people their lives and a whole bunch of people got seriously burned because nobody responded to a fire alarm that was based on a real fire. So in closing, NFPA 72 classes the fire alarm system based on how they operate. Some systems rely on a person, those local or protected premises only, to initiate alarm and to notify the fire department. Other systems are very automatic, very intricate. You get an alarm at the um, panel, in the whole building, and at a reporting station who will uh, call the fire department. <clears throat> the most sophisticated systems not only automatically activate and report, they're gonna give very specific information, like in those enunciator panels where the fire department comes in, they look at the enunciator panel, they know the room and even what kind of a device. So it's really great. The installation requirements for the fire alarm systems depend on the use and occupancy conditions, um, how many people, the occupant load, all of these different considerations, uh, how high, how low, what are they making there, all of these things go together. <clears throat> So those, uh, there's also special use and occupancy conditions. A mall is going to have one. Uh, an amusement park, uh, the rides are going to have them. Um, and also might have to have other things as well. A high-rise building has to have a communication system. An amusement building has to have a communication system. So special use might require additional um, parts to the system. NFPA 72 is our code and it continues to be the standard um, even though it's very comprehensive and it tells us the um, how, all of the how stuff, how to design it, how to install it, how to inspect it, how to test it, how to service it, all the hows. However, sometimes we have to reference other standards like the electric code, the mechanical code. Lastly, that acceptance test is very important and uh, a fire protection or I'm sorry, a fire prevention inspector is going to be there. Now, one thing I didn't say when I was talking about this earlier, very important. If you are ever a fire prevention inspector, you don't touch any of the equipment. You don't push the manual fire alarm. You don't blow the smoke into the smoke detector. You don't reset the system. You keep your hands off of everything. They do it. The fire alarm company does it. You're, you, you've got a clipboard and a pen or an iPad and a way to touch it, <laughs> whether it's one of those iPad pens or your finger. Um, you are recording it and witnessing it. You don't do it. Very important because of liability. You don't want them coming back saying, yeah, well, he broke our $500 such and such, you know. Nope, nope, never touch it, never do it. Um, I, I made that mistake a couple of times. It never bit me, uh, you know, in the keister, but I, you know, did that a couple of times and I told somebody about it and they said, no, 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 never do that. Okay, so there's also that periodic inspection, testing, and service that has to happen on a basis that's established by NFPA 72 to maintain it and to ensure its reliability. Boy, the last thing you want. Listen, I'm just going to close with this. We, um, in our fire prevention class, we do a whole thing about smoke detectors in the home. When's the last time you changed the batteries in your smoke detectors? I cannot tell you how many times firefighters go to homes where families get burned and lives are destroyed and they had smoke detectors, but there are no batteries in them.
it's it's just horrific it's it's horrible when it happens so make sure that you're maintaining the system that's in your home check your batteries make sure that it's working correctly if it's making that obnox obnoxious beep noise fix it put in a new battery don't just ignore it okay uh so randy osborne out boy this one was supposed to be shorter i'm sorry that was too long i just talked too much okay i'm gonna stop talking see you later have a great day